again, and welcome back to another episode of Hairbrain Games. Today I'm going to talk to you about a little gem I found a couple years ago that has become kind of a mainstay, a staple in my casual gaming groups. It's fun, it's approachable, it's fast. It is Rise of Augustus. It's about a 30 minute game or so, two to six players, but you want to play with at least three, I believe. Uh, what, is the, what is the point? Well, Augustus, as some of you in Roman historian buffs know, was one of the great Caesars of history, and you are serving him, and your job is to build up military and political power and take over provinces and basically jockey for position to be uh, the top right-hand man of Caesar Augustus. So how does it play, and do I like it? Well, let's find out. All right, so here's an example of setup. Setup is... 30 seconds to a minute, really, to just get all the pieces out there and going. Uh, not a lot of components to the game, but uh, so they make each component matter. So basically, in the center of the table, for all players, will be the following objectives. These objectives to be earned, these objectives to be earned, special objectives, and a kind of a slight nod to Settlers of Catan. These are five cards that as players complete objectives, because these are the objectives of the game, they will grab a objective to replace the one that they had in their tableau, which we'll see shortly, and a deck of objectives. These are really conquer points, I call them, but they're actually the cards that you're going to influence, slash threaten, slash uh, bribe in order to uh, win. The object of the game is to successfully uh, complete seven of these card objectives. Once you have seven of these in your completed objectives row, the game ends at the end of your turn. So speed is of the essence usually in this regard. In these cards, this these are the the requirements. You must use the mobilization um, of your armies must be applied here. When you're done, you get this bonus here, which we'll go over these in more specific detail, but that's an example of a card. That's one type of card. The other type of card is a card for a province colony. Uh, basically, once again, same thing, what it takes to subdue this and what you get from it, three victory points, no special ability there. Although these are meaningful, and it's it's very interesting and detailed that each of these matches one of the provinces that the Romans went ahead and took over during their the height of their glory. So that's that. Every player begins with three of these objective cards in their tableau. Now these go in a row called the uncompleted objectives row. I like to keep it organized with my seven legions. Each of these legions will be used to complete objectives on these cards. When a completed objective occurs, when a player completes an objective, they are moved, after the special ability is reconciled, over into the completed row. This is the row where you want seven cards to be able to win. Now rather than go any further, although I'll show you the other the other fake player that's going along too, same situation, nothing identical. So we're going to basically start a gameplay session and it will become very clear by the end of the first turn exactly what's going on for the most part and how the game plays out in its elegance and simplicity. The starting player is ready to take the first turn. In this bag are mobilization tokens. Now there are these types of tokens are all in the bag and each one maps to a different kind of type of mobilization. You got your shield, you got your your dagger. Let me flip it over so that we're not showing you the Australian version. And then the uh, chariot and the catapult, etc. And then these wild tokens. Notice that certain tokens are much less frequent than others, which should help you when you're like deciding how difficult it is to achieve a given card. Most of the time, the victory points kind of tell you how difficult a particular card is to achieve. Alright, so in our first turn we're going to reach into the magic bag of mobilization tokens and we're going to a shield! Announce a shield. Now everybody gets to take part in this, not just the player who who selects the, the tokens from the bag. So we have shield, so now we look and go, well, what do I want to do? I think this one's the most achievable, so I'm going to mobilize one token, only one, one, one legion per per token. Then we go over here and we're left with the same situation. Of course this is an easier situation because we only have one card that has that token. And that's it. That's the end of a single single round. So then we do it again and we... Swords. Well that's not a surprise. That's very common. 
So he's going to start putting it here, although you could easily get this one done too. Same over here. Once again, we're left with choices. I could place it here, however, I really do want to try to get my token done. And then we go back and continue to do this now. There we go. Look at that. Oh, wow. Now the decision to be made, do I want to use this? Because very likely I'm not going to get one, two, three, four, five, six. I don't even have six. Which means I'd have to pull one of my Legionnaires off of an existing um, card if I was going to even have a chance to complete this. But there's no harm in doing that right now. Then over here, we look and go, hmm. I am absolutely stumped. I have nothing. Absolutely nothing to do. So there are times when that will occur. Alright, and then we keep going. Another shield. So we're going to wrap up shields there. And I'm just going to go ahead and do the other turn. There's nothing on the other side. Now we're going to keep rolling. Oh look, we got the wild card. Now the wild card has two important purposes, the wild token. One, you can put a legionnaire anywhere you want anywhere in your tableau of in construction cards so that's the one advantage of it so obviously i want to try to finish this card up i know that this one is a little bit more rare than that one so i'll take my chances there over here i want to decide and this is great because we know that this is the most rare of the tokens so i'm going to go ahead and get that out of the way right there the other thing about this is that once this shows up once this token arrives, all of the tokens go back in the bag and play, sorry, play then, the person that actually grabs the tokens is the next player over here. So we would give the bag to the next player, who then becomes the town crier, to be able to grab tokens. Now I'm going to grab a token here, and this token will be... Oh, look at that. So I have a chance. I'm going to sit there. Now we have a situation here where I have just completed my building. Look at, or my, I've completed bribing this dude. So what do I do? I scream out, Ave Maria! No, wait, that was a different game. Ave Caesar. That's what I have to yell out. And if people do it in multiple at the same time, then the card number uh, indicates who goes first, lowest to highest. I have completed this, so what do I get out of it? Jack Squat. Some, some cards give me bonuses, but in this case, I got nothing. But I do get to remove my units so I can use them again. I put this completed objective into the completed objectives area, which means I get 8 points ahead of the game and I'm already 1 7th the way to victory. And then I go up here and I grab whatever card I want. This one's pretty tri tricky, but boy, I like the special ability. It means my pink tokens can actually be used for those rare yellow tokens if I complete these objectives. These only matter if I complete the objectives. I'm going to go for this one. I'm going to try and keep it simple. So I put that over there and now I've got my loadout of objectives again. And that's how play goes. Play continues on in this fashion. Say, for example, that I were to finish this one. Well, if I finish this one, then I get the special ability that shows up in the top right corner of it. And that basically says that I can put two legions immediately. When I, when I complete this objective, when I'm done, and I'm like, yay, I did it. Then I get to take these off. I can immediately take any of these two and put them on any other objective, which means I could basically complete that objective and be halfway through to completing the next one. That's a nice bonus. It's only worth three victory points, but boy, it can sure lead to other things. Um, and that's basically the primary mechanism of scoring points. Now let me tell you about what you can do at the end of any of your turns. These, you can achieve any one of these you want, and they're very different. So basically, if I have three gray consulate cards in my tableau, I can grab that. And that gives me an extra two points. If I, you'll notice I have two greens right now. So if I were to get three of those here, I would get four points. If I get one of each type of, of colors, there's three colors of provinces, I get that. If I get all three purples or all, all three oranges, I get those. So you can take any of those at any time you want. That's different from the rules here. Here, as you're collecting cards, this is a push your luck mini push your luck mechanism. As you collect cards in your tableau and get you know two, four, six, doesn't matter what kind they are, you can at any point at the end of your turn go, 
I'm grabbing this one. I have four cards in my tableau. I'm grabbing it. What that means is you don't have a lot of confidence that you're going to get the fifth card before somebody wins. But on the other hand, if you're if you're on your way up and you're at your fifth card, you get your sixth card, you, there's no reason not to grab that. Because once you grab that, no one else can have it. So you basically have this opportunity to kind of like nudge your score a little bit, but also take a risk by guessing whether you're going to have a chance to get these cards. Because if the game ends, someone gets seven cards in their tableau before you get here, you don't get these extra points. And that can be pretty devastating in a game like this. The final way you score points is with these particular golden golden tokens. Now, if I if I was to complete this objective, notice I have one wheatgrass stew icon. Then I get this token, but I only get it as long as I have more wheat than anyone else. If someone else gets a wheat, it goes to them. If I get two wheat and they have one, I get it. If they match my wheat, they get it. And this goes back and forth. This is the little mini tennis game, per se, of that. And that's really what they're valuable for and the only way they're valuable. But basically, the game ends when all seven cards are in a tableau, completed, and then we add up the points. And you'll see in my scorecard here that we have... A nice handy scorecard that tells us all of the ways that we can earn points and how we can earn points through the various mechanisms. Um, you can see I hardly ever win, but I won one out of two. That's not bad. And that's basically it for uh, Rise of Augustus. Let's go into our final thoughts and tell you whether I think the game's right for for you or someone else or everybody or nobody or somebody or whatever. Okay, so, after that gameplay run-through, it's time for some final thoughts on what I think of Rise of Augustus. First off, is this right for you? Well, are you someone who loves to play simple mechanics, but with a twist? This game's for you. If you're not someone who wants to spend more than 15-20 minutes playing a game, but still wants to feel like you've had some value to your session, yes, this game's for you. This is not a game with an incredible amount of depth or complexity. This isn't a brain burner by any means. It is a game that will appeal to anyone who has a casual audience that they routinely or even occasionally have over or host or bring to such venues. What I like about it is it's a quick and easy satisfying game, and here's how. First off, this is effectively... Um, bingo it's basically the at the, its core element it's a bingo element game you are grabbing pieces and matching them to certain certain tiles on a certain board in this case you have several cards that you're placing them on but in a regular bingo game it's like look for a row look for a column in this case you're just lining up the columns does that make it bad no actually it's probably the most advanced game of bingo you'll ever play uh, it's exciting to see a designer take a simple, well-known mechanism and convert it into a way that gamers and non-gamers alike can find appealing. Because it is like bingo, one of the values out of it is that everybody's always playing. You're not round-robin taking turns. Everybody's always involved every step of the way. Every time someone puts their hand in the cookie jar of, of tiles... Uh, you have the opportunity and a little bit of excitement, actually, to grab that tile out and go, ah, oh, I did it, I did it. Instead of bingo, it's Ave Caesar, which is a corny thing to say, but eventually you kind of get used to it, and if everyone's doing it, it's not so embarrassing, I'm told. So that's what I like about it. The other thing I like about it is that as you are completing these objectives, these mini objectives, you're getting special bonuses, and those bonuses often cascade. So, for example, in the example that I gave, I finished one card out and completed it. Yay, objective's one. That mini objective is in there, but also it feeds right into the next objective. You can string those together if you want, or if you want to use it a different way, you can go, you know what, I want three provinces of the same color because I don't see anyone else looking for those, and I can get that, and then I can get the special bonus tile. Very rarely do people actually go for the transitory tiles of the gold and the wheat. Those aren't, they play a part almost 
by happenstance more than they do by directed gameplay choices. Uh, also, because it's kind of a race, you're also trying to go for those other you know card tiles too. But ultimately, every time you play, there's just a little bit of a bent, a little bit of a different uh, direction you can take for the game, despite its simplicity. Now, games tend to be fairly close. Not too often do you have someone who has all seven tiles before anyone else gets two or three. That can happen, but not often. And so, playing it is rich, the coloring and the, the card work, artwork and everything is just rich and thematic and styled to, to Mr. Caesar here, Caesar Augustus, who looks a lot happier than I think he was in real life, especially towards the end. Now, what are some cons about it? Well, it's not a brain burner, and it's not something you're going to bring as, as the meat of your gameplay sessions, for the most part. Uh, that's about the only thing I have against it because honestly, it's easy to teach. Is it a gateway game? Kind of close to. There's only a couple little tiny oddnesses. People got tripped up a little bit on the fact that one type of victory card that you earn, uh, you can get as many of as you want, but the other kind, you only get one of, and that tripped people up a little bit, but one game into it and they're done. So this game, as I recommend it, I think it's an exceptional game for what it intends to do, which is to be a casual game that appeals to a wide variety of people of different varying degrees of gamer experience. I don't know how common it is to get anymore. I was able to get this copy for around 20 bucks, which was more than up to, to, to a value, incredible value for what I've gotten out of it. So if you get a chance to get it and it's, it's in the you know, 20, 25 dollar range, I think you can do a lot worse than Rise of Augustus. Anyway, that's it for today, and we will talk to you next time on Hairbrain Games.